Hello, everybody. Nice to be here again. It's a nice, quiet, slightly smoky Sunday in Morgantown, West Virginia. We don't have that much longer to go. Uh, I'm looking at the calendar here and I'm saying it uh, looks like uh, two weeks to me. So this is our tutorial, June 11th. Uh, let me get, there we go. Uh, module five is this week. So this week we have three things due. You can read them at the bottom there. Graded activity, graded activity, graded activity. I was very happy with your work uh, from last uh, week. For the case and the idea assignment, the uh, medium scores were in the very high 90s. However, there were some non-submissions and those zeros pull the average down. But uh, those of you that did the work, high 90s. For the tests, the average were 93 and 90, which is fine by me. However, I am still puzzled as to why the questions that we do in class, the practice questions are among the um, worst results. So we'll do four again today and see where the, where the test five uh, turns the corner and we get full points for the ones we cover in class. Thank you for reminding me about module five. This is what module five looks like. So of course you can just uh, take a screenshot now if you like, but I'm gonna insert the link to tonight's class and then I will post module five uh, up on the, on the board. Um, we have this to cover for this week, two chapters and something in idea. I'm gonna go back to some old slides here we go. And just talk about chapter 10. In chapter 10, this, this was a research question that I had going back to something like 2008. I said, how can we quantify the difference between two sets of financial statements? Uh, how can I say how much bigger or more or greater one is than the other? And I wanted that measure to be on a scale of zero to one. So you can see on the left there, if there's no change, that's the score. If the two are wildly different, the score should be one. So I have the real number line there, and I just want to use that little segment from zero to one to quantify uh, the difference between two sets of financial statements. I can quite easily quantify the difference between two numbers we just call that subtraction. I don't know if you can remember this. Uh, Joe the plumber. Does that ring a bell from Ohio from many years ago? And so I said to myself, if we took Joe the plumber's financial statements and we compared it to Microsoft, I should get a change of close to one. Those two sets of financial statements should be wildly different. However, if I take Microsoft and compare Microsoft to itself, then the change should be over there, uh, close to zero. Um, we have lots of financial ratios. This is just an extract from an auditing book. You can see we have a liquidity, profitability, all sorts of ratios. And I just wanted to work, end up with one ratio that says the whole picture, how much things have changed. To do that, I had to employ the concept of vectors. Um, anybody, um, does the word vector ring a bell? Does the, does the word Pavlov ring a bell? Maybe not. And so this is a simple example, and the simple example only has two entries, and this is because I can graph it. So let's say we have a set of financial statements and all we're recording is total assets and revenues. In 2007, these were the numbers. In 2008, those are the numbers. And I'm now going to try and ascertain what the difference is. I can actually graph these two points. 2.8, can you remember that? The first one is always the X. Two and 0.8. The other one was three and four, up from the three and across to the four. And I have these two dots here, 
representing these very simple financial statements in two-dimensional space. Now I can create a vector going from zero to those two points. We can see we, we have the two points over here. And now I'm simply going to take an arrow to there and an arrow to there. There we go. And now, if I must say so myself, this is rather brilliant. What we do is to quantify the difference between these two sets of financial statements, we look at this vector, which is the difference between the two vectors. So from this point to that point, we have C. And if these two financial statements are really close to each other, then C will be small. If they are really big, then C will be big. And I just use this formula in the end. I take the length of C, the length of C, and I divide it by the length of B plus the length of A. And I will get a ratio then, which will go somewhere from zero to exactly one. If the two vectors are really close like this, then C will be small. And that difference, C divided by A plus B will be small. Over here, C is pretty much medium-ish. And if I divide it by these two numbers, I'm gonna get something close to a half. And if the two vectors look something like this, then C is really large and the difference is big or close to one. So that's enough there. So this is chapter 10, and this is a new chapter in the book, and I'm quite proud of it. And quite amazingly, I uh, used the Joe Biden example, not uh, in the least guessing that, that he would be a very important public figure right now. So one way that we could use it is we could compare the trial balance for 2019 to the trial balance for 2020, and we could get a score saying how big the difference is, and that score will go from zero to one. There we go. Um, does this ring a bell? Uh, things with matrix, M rows, N columns, or is all this all too far into the past? Is this kind of like on par with like, like coefficients and like efficient market, like portfolio theory? Because the vectors that was kind of like giving me like little like synapse firing because I know the efficient frontiers like there'll be kind of like convergence and graphs and stuff like that but that's from like a financial perspective. I know what you're talking about and I'm going to just have to think about whether there's a link between that and this. Um, and much of what we analyze in Excel is a matrix of data with M rows and N columns. Where is my example? Here we go. So here we have Joe Biden's tax returns. We have the year while he was still vice president, and we have the year after vice president. So while he was vice president, you can see there wages, salaries, and things, 315,000. Um, total income, 396,000. The year after vice president, we can see 11 million. So that is a big change. And what we would like is I would like my scoring technique to show that that is a big difference. So we can go back here. I can do two trial balances. Uh, here we go, purchasing card. I don't think there's anything dramatic there. Here we go. And again, uh, I have a vector there, and I have a vector here. I can graph these two vectors. This is two and a half, one. There's two and a half, one. And this is four, three, up at four, and across is three. I have two vectors. And again, my formula is the length of C divided by the length of A plus the length of B. Here we go. This is the length of A, and we'll, have, we'll do an example at the end, the length of B, and this is how you calculate the length of C. We will do an actual example right at the end. Um, 
And then we have to divide the length of C divided by these two lengths over here. There we go. We can also calculate the angle, and I'm not sure whether any of the test questions ask you to do the angle. And this is my score. I changed the words, but it is the length of C divided by the length of A plus the length of B. Here we go, a small difference, a medium difference, a big difference, and I calculate a difference here, 0 0.03, 0 0.59 over there, and 0.99 over there. This is Joe Biden. How about, I think, let's just jump ahead. Joe Biden's tax returns. Uh, the angle is very high, and the vector variation score is 0.966. It says that there's a huge difference between his 2016 and his 2017 numbers, as we would expect. Here's test 5A. There we go. Vector A has components. Vector B has components. Calculate the length of C. You want to give it a try? So it is five, six, and seven, one. And we are going to be using this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my vector, here we go, go here. I'm now going to insert a vector. And I need to move my controls here. Do you ever use this? Um, I'm in Microsoft Word. I'm going to go insert, insert equation, insert new equation. And then once I'm here, amazingly, I have to go to equation up here, matrix over there. And this is the one that I want right there. So, do you remember those numbers? Vector A was five, six, five, six, five, six, five, six. I'm going to zoom it a bit. There we go. Vector A was five, six, and B was seven, one, seven, one, there we go. So my vector is cruising around over there. And let me put a space, here we go. And now I have to use this formula right over there. So I know what it is. It's BI minus AI squared. Add them and then take the square root, here we go. Over here, this is BI and that's AI. So seven minus five squared is how much? Two. Squared is four. Is four. Um, so it is actually seven minus five squared equal four. And the next one will be the six minus one squared equal. Why is it not one minus six to keep it consistent? Uh, you, uh, I, I could do that. No problem. The nice thing is because we're squaring, we can subtract in any order. Um, so, five? fair comment. That's, so that, that's five. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one minus six is five, but squared is 25. Now we go back here quickly and take another peek. So we've done this and we've done this. We got four over here and we got 25 over there, we need to take the square root.
equal the square root of um. four plus twenty-five. And I don't expect you to know that in your head, but the answer there is five point three. Five point three nine. So the answer is not blowing in the wind, as Bob Dylan said. When I use this, I get 5.39. And come back here. Uh, 5.39 gives me an answer of? C. C. So we're good. So now I'm going to go back to this little document over here. And I'll just do, so you can find it again, something like that. Copy. Paste. I hope you like my nice demonstration of how not to copy and paste, but now we've copied and pasted. So there's the answer, 5.39. We'll come back to the rest later on. I like this, and I wish somebody would use it in some more academic research. Uh, I'm happy to say that we finally got published. This was, I think, 2021 Managerial Auditing Journal. There we have it, and using analytic geometry, myself and Karsten's a physicist from St. Michael's College up in Burlington, Vermont. Um, anything here? This was just looking at uh, the Joe Biden results. Chapter 13. Uh, have you had a look at chapter 13? I glanced at it. Thank I you. I didn't finish it. Okay. It's a whole case all about Harriet Walters. Harriet worked for the District of Columbia and over a period of around uh, 18 years, Harriet stole close to $50 million. This was Harriet's house as she doesn't live there anymore. I took these photos myself. Harriet lived over there. Um, most recent valuation, 955,000. Harriet had an absolutely wonderful lifestyle because of stolen money. Right over here, Timothy Lynch of the FBI described her home as a high temple of conspicuous consumption. And when the FBI say you have a home that looks like that, it's really nice. They see nice houses. A dysfunctional work environment. So this is the Office of Tax Revenue. Uh, I can just read a few of these things. A culture of apathy and silence. Employees did the bare minimum. Many employees knew that Walters lavished gifts and extraordinary sums of money on friends and co-workers. Um, employees sometimes gathered outside her office to receive the fruits of her largesse. I think that means she gave them stuff. No one asked about where she got this money from. And it was only because of a bank employee that Harriet's scheme came to light. So let's have a look. In the beginning, this is Harriet. Harriet started nice and slow. I don't know if you can hear the train. There's a train about a mile away from here, and I can hear it in my office now. Harriet started in 1989. You tell me who had a hit CD titled 1989? Taylor Swift. I think maybe, maybe we're a little older than Taylor's fan base. Um, started in 1989, and here you can see, each time she processed a fraudulent refund, it was in the region of $4,000. Um, wouldn't raise many eyebrows, 
Then Harriet got bolder and bigger. We can see over here, she's dipping in 62,000, 28,000. And we have basically all the way down here, enough to buy a car each time. Well, by about 1994, Harriet upped the game. And in this case, every time she steals, it is car, 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 car. Except right at the bottom, which I hope you can see, nothing's blocking it out there. She, in one go, processed a fraudulent tax refund for 543000 And that, to me, sounds like a very, very nice house. And now Harriet's going in full swing here, 1998. You can see at the top there, most of these numbers, enough to buy a nice house. Right about here, I have a bit of a problem with this 250000 um, if we think about it, what Harriet used was, I'm right over here, court-ordered assessment refunds. So this is where the taxpayer is assessed at this value for tax purposes. The taxpayer says, no, my building isn't worth that much, it's worth this much. And after years of going through the court proceedings, finally the court might mandate that the uh, taxpayer requires a refund of that difference times the tax rate, 2.65%, plus 5.5% interest for the period overpaid. And the chances of that difference times the tax rate plus interest for the period overpaid equaling exactly 250,000 are close to zero. I uh, can see at the bottom there, 126,000. On this page, something should jump out to you. And tell me what has jumped out to you on that page. Penny. <laughs> um. I'm going to give you a clue. The first two words are hold for. Uh, I'll hold for a pickup. <laughs> hold for pickup. Um, so in this case, the checks were not mailed to any address. They were held for pickup. And because they remained at the office, Harriet picked them up. So in general, it is a good internal control when checks are cut and checks are prepared for some third party that they get mailed to that third party. Hold for pickup, very bad. Look at was, all was, her, was her lawyer in on this? It's um, hard to, um, she had a whole group of people who were in on the scheme. Um, quite right, that's how she got to the 48 million. Yeah, she had a lot of her family members involved. And that's I worked for a company that was trying to get income tax refunds from D.C. Yeah. And supposedly their treasury is out of money. And now we know why, right? Yes. This was yeah. about the time frame where they quit issuing refunds to corporations. Yes. They ran out of money. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, these round numbers, I can point there 335,000, 324,000, 326,000, uh, 340,000. Again, I stress that the difference times the tax rate plus 5.5% interest for the period overpaid, the chances of it coming out to a neat multiple of 1,000 are close to zero. They had a friend that was in on it and he worked for Bank of America. He got terminated and Jay Reese, the niece, opened up a small, uh, an account at a small bank, at least a bank branch inside a supermarket and deposited this check. And that was the beginning of the end of Harriet's scheme. And I just remind you of one thing, once the FBI got wind of the scheme, they actually told the District of Columbia to, to let the scheme keep running so that they could, could collect uh, irrefutable evidence that the scheme was up and going. 
So your first um, in inclination might be to close down a scheme. Not so fast. Harriet had expensive tastes. You can read the top lines there. Oops. And here's another problem. If Harriet is spending that amount at Neiman Marcus and that amount at Nordstrom, she would be far better dressed than the average person in the office who was earning probably $80,000 a year at the time. And nobody appeared to say, why does Harriet wear all these very nice clothes on what would, what would be a, a normal salary? Uh, Adored jewelers, lucky them, a million and fifty. Harriet liked to gamble. And uh, maybe we can talk about this more during our re residency. Gambling is an expensive vice. And I'm not sure why she gambled. Uh, if you have so much money from a fraud scheme, do you, I don't even want to go sit at the tables and try and make more. This is our graph of Harriet's fraud amounts. So we have time over here. <clears throat> it ran for 18 years. We have time, we have the amount there and anything stand out, um, notice anything? It grew. It grew. <laughs> I'm also going to guesstimate like this massive outlier. I want to say like maybe that's 1997 where it's like, yeah, that one. That's like almost like probably like 500,000. Correct. That is, remember at the bottom of the one page was the amount I said could be a house. So <clears throat> that was Harriet's, I think it was 543,000. Uh, for me, it's hard to believe that somebody could, steal that amount of money and simply think you can get away with it, although she did. And here's another one. And it was only because of what happened with the bank manager that picked up this 410,000 then that she would have been caught. Um, if, she, if she had stopped right around then, she wouldn't have been caught. Um, getting bigger and the spread is getting higher. These are Harriet's first digits. Um, surprising or unsurprising? Not surprising. Do you think maybe she, at the, because she was able to run it for so long that she just thought she was never going to get caught? Yes, yes. Just, and absolutely amazingly, she must have thought that she's just not going to get caught because she, was, she made some bad mistakes in the end. I don't get people like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't get into their mindset. Quite right, nor, nor can I. <laughs> so this is not surprising because Harriet invented all the numbers and uh, at least what we'd like to think with Benford's law, lots of invented numbers will not follow Benford's law. Uh, second digits, she sure didn't like the second digit, zero. I think it's a test question, but don't quote me. Yeah. The last two digits, the cents amounts, and if we are talking about overpayment refunds or that court order difference, the cents should have been evenly spread from 00 to 99, but Harriet really liked, she really liked those double O's. And the double O's would be the, um, the ones here with no sense. So even some basic analytics on these refund numbers. Amazingly, Harriet used the same dollar amount 14 times, it's uh, well, it was different dollar amounts, but she duplicated a dollar amount 14 times. And this is quite amazing. Um, if we look over here, these are really odd numbers. 
and for her to have used them twice is uh, very strange unless she had the documentation ready for that amount and was just a little bit lazy um anything jump out at you on that page the team member yes yes uh, yes yes and this is the niece but the other thing that should jump it's out all real is, estate which i thought was fascinating it, it is all real estate uh, refunds um, which is a huge amount for a refund uh -huh. and, and b there's not that much taxable real estate in washington dc there's plenty of federal government buildings but they don't pay taxes well and she chose public companies which i think is interesting yeah. Trammell, Boston Properties, I mean, those are things, First American Home, you could easily identify from their books Yes, if this is correct. Um, the, main, the big thing here is this Lincoln Square. Um, if somebody was stealing 375,800, the least they could do is learn how to spell Lincoln correctly number one and number two if you are in america in washington dc you can also learn how to spell lincoln correctly and and not even for three hundred and seventy-five thousand eight hundred. uh this is part of your case uh this is walter jones he was the employee uh, working at the bank of america i took these photos myself um this was where she opened the bank account the niece opened the bank account in this safe way and um, she deposited the four hundred and ten thousand. and i just ask you if, if you're going to deposit four hundred and ten thousand dollars and you want it not to be noticed what bank where do you use a bigger bank with more Jeez. well she well, used like MoneyGram or like one of those courier services where you can wire stuff? Well, she should have used a bank in downtown New York City, downtown Boston, downtown Chicago. Um, well, it's a private bank in general. <laughs> yes. That are um, used to transactions like that. Yes, a bank teller would see 410000 in downtown Boston and she'd forget about you within two minutes of you walking out because there'll be another big check in a few minutes from now. That was uh, Chris Thorne worked at that bank and they didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> Sentenced to 17 and a half years and we'll see in a moment. Uh, this is an awfully long time, an awfully long time. I know it's a lot of money, but uh, that's very high. So I keep watching my, my customers as such. And this was the Bureau of Prisons record. Um, we've done this before, the Bureau of Prisons. You look up an inmate. Oh. Yeah. It's a bit like um, you just enter, you do find my name, you enter first name, last name, and you get all the details. Is a bit like uh, Facebook for the for the less fortunate. Yeah. She was in Baltimore, and the release date was October twenty twenty two. And just to remind you, this scheme went all the way up until around uh, September of two thousand and seven, and then she was placed in cuffs and not released on bail. Um, so she'd been in custody since August of 2007. Long time. Uh, release date, supposed to be October 2022, but in fact released early. You can see there, released uh, January 2022. That's a long time. Richard Hatch. Richard Hatch is actually in the um, in another chapter. I don't think Richard is in the Harriet chapter, but we can talk just a little bit about Richard Hatch. Um, he he is in one of the chapters, is he not? Have you have you looked? Yeah, yeah. yeah. in chapter ten. He, he's in the first chapter then. Yeah. 
So this is Rich, Richard Hatch's indictment. And this was the first indictment I ever came across. And it piqued my interest in, in all things fraud and, and the like. And uh, this is Hatch. Uh, Hatch applied to be a contestant on the show Survivor. Uh, it was filmed March 1st through April 15th. So I call this six weeks of camping on the beach. And for six weeks of camping on the beach, Hatch ends up with $1 million and 10,000 to appear on the finale. After the finale, they prepare two checks. They give him the two checks, the million and the 10,000. Uh, he endorses the one check and he deposits the other check. Hatch has received 1 million and 10,000. Early in 2001, the company sends him a 1099 MISC, which looks something like this. And anybody want to tell me just what is on that 1099 MISC? The money he got from Survivor, all of it. It, it, it has the details of the money. It has his name, social security number, address. It's a full record of the fact that he got a million and 10,000. In March, 2001, he goes to an accounting firm. He gives them the 1099 MISC amongst other things. And they conclude that he owes 441,000 in taxes comprised of Taxes and interest and penalties, 441. Not very good news. On or about November 20th, a member of the firm met with Hatch and handed him the income tax return. I ask you, since you are knowledgeable professionals, what is the latest date you can file a tax return and still be within your within your allowance time as such. April 15th. But then you can get an extension. And then you have until October 15th. October, yeah. Yes, and it's October 15th with an extension and nobody gets an extension past October 15th. It's, but the, that's, that's the it. The taxes still do on April 15th though, right? Like he still technically owed the $4,000 as of April 15th. He yeah, just didn't have right. to follow Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah. So now he, he uh, so they do it November 20th. This is one month after the, the end of these kind of forgiveness period. If you have an extension, they give him the tax return saying that he owes 441. Uh, he told a member of the firm that he would file, but he just didn't file. A month later, oh, this, this was his rental home, and I, I, I took that photo myself. Uh, this was his rental home, and in around December, he goes to another accountant, and he tells the accountant that he did have this rental property, but he said he got no income from that. On March 1st, 2002, how long does it take to do a tax return? This one is not that complex and it shouldn't take from December to March. Hands him the tax return. It included survivor, but it excluded some other sources of income. And he also made up the fact that he had some management fee and publicist's fee. He made up some expenses, but now it's looking a bit better. They say he owes the IRS 234000 I suspect that the new accountant took into account these bogus deductions, but she also left off the interest and penalties because you can confirm it here. Uh, you can leave them off the tax return and then they will process your return and send you a bill. That is correct? Yep, that's right. Yes. yes. So, uh, so now it's down to 234, although he's going to get a bad surprise when he gets that late uh, uh, bill in the fall of 2002 remember this is for the year 2000 
He told the accountant that he wanted to know what his tax liability would have been for the year if he had not received his survivor's winnings. She says, I'll give it to you on a spreadsheet. He says, no, I want the tax return. I want to see what it would look like without survivor. She prepared a return that left off survivor. The return concluded that without survivor, he would have been due a refund of 4,483. On November 19th, so now you can see we are pretty much, uh, how much late with this tax return? A year and a half. We're, we're more than a year late, yes. Um, on November, the accountant hands hatch the return, which excludes survivor. She tells him orally and in writing. So I'm not sure how you can be more clear than orally and in writing that this was for informational purposes only. Hatch agreed orally and in writing. What's interesting to me, though, is that like and. Not going to air out my mom's stuff, but like there was legal stuff in the IRS, like they can take a levy and literally freeze your account and wipe it. So it's like if this man is being delinquent, it doesn't make any sense. It's like they literally can just garnish his wages, pull the balance out of his account. It's like I don't understand why this indictment took so long and I don't know why there wasn't any involvement. Uh, fair comments. No, 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 very fair comments. Um, quite right. They have huge powers. Here we go. So now he took it, he signed the return and filed it with the IRS. So it left off that million dollars and that million dollars and 10,000 should have gone over there. He went to court. He was found guilty right over here. Guilty tax evasion, tax evasion for the next year and tax evasion for the S corporation. He was found not guilty of wire fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, and bank fraud. At that stage, Richard Hatch should have said, I am the luckiest person in the world. I got the million to start off with, and I got not guilty on all these counts, four through to 10, because those counts, have huge potential penalties. But Hatch still decided no, and he, he just made his life, if I can use bad English, more worser and more worser. Um, generally, if any of you get a million dollars from camping on a beach for six weeks, um, just didn't pay the tax and just enjoy your life afterwards. It's just a huge, nice little bonus that will smooth out a whole lot of bumps and hiccups in your life. So that's Richard Hatch, and we're going to, let's talk a little bit about the test. Here we go. So the label could not be clearer. Please, don't get number five wrong. But how about number nine? Um, liar, mail, mail fraud, and banking. Good call. Nine, I'm going to point. Wire, mail, and bank. Uh, we can just go back here. was found guilty on all three counts and not guilty on the wire, mail, and bank. Um, and I just remind you for the 10th time, uh, it might not be B for you. Uh, the program will shuffle things around. Okay. 5B. Number nine. So, so she forged the letter saying everything is good. That check uh, to First American Home, everything is good. 
and then she mailed it. It opened her up to a felony charge of mail fraud. Mail fraud, correct. Mail spelt M A I L, mail fraud. Wire fraud is a federal offense, and the other two are just made up words. The niece, uh, so, so uh, on November 7th, both of them got arrested. And so she was basically away from November 7th, 2007, at Tilly Sol October 2022. And when I, when I tell these dates to my uh, undergraduate students, uh, it's most of their life is encompassed by, by uh, that range of dates. So now we're gonna get good marks on number 10 because the answer is... Not herself to be interviewed? I couldn't hear, just... Oh, she allowed herself to be interviewed. That is correct. She allowed herself to be interviewed is the most correct answer there. Um, maybe next week I will just remind myself um, about the link interview. And I will give you a link to a YouTube video which will tell you that the Worst thing that you can do is allow yourself to be interviewed as she did without it's funny. The, without the it's presence funny of that. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I cut you off. It's funny because she was dealing with all of these lawyers all the time. You would think that that she would know better. <laughs> mm. yes. And she would have could one of them represented her. I mean, come on now. <laughs> yes. So a fatal error. Um, so you have the two questions. Here's a little bit more, and then we're just going to quickly look at what we have to do this week. This is what I see, and my idea academic portal might be different to yours, but I see this thing cruising at the bottom here. Caseware idea academic certification. And they talk about the academic CIDA exam. This is what, what the exam will cost you if you weren't a student, but if you went for the full CIDA. So now you have decided, I really love IDEA and I want to get that CIDA certification. Watch. 850 for the first, um, this is a, a course. 850 for the second course, which is two days. The prep course, the workbook, the same workbook that we got for free, the exam fee. You can see they cross this out and say, it's not gonna cost you that, it's only gonna cost you the number in red. Now, we as students can go and do the academic, CIDA. So it's going to have that word academic in front of it. It's going to be an easier exam. It's going to be shorter. And it should take you probably one and a half hours. And you can see the price at the bottom there. How's that price? I'm just going to go back and just remind you that there's the price for others. There's our price. Um, a nice improvement. <laughs> I'm thinking it's a very nice improvement. $20. This is the workbook. So if we go back to the um, that academ uh, academic portal, you can see the idea workbook is here. You can download it, no problem. It looks like this, and you can see right over here, I should have it still up, idea workbook. There it 
There we go. I have it and I'm at page 158. You can see the pages go to 282. I get through about 50 pages a day and after 50 pages, I'm just tired. I mean, that's enough idea. I'm, I'm, I'm done with idea. It's not that it takes me a whole day to do 50 pages. It's just after two hours, I'm done. Um, and I'm at page 158 now, and I'm working through this um, quite at the rate of uh, 50 pages a day. And then I'm going to write the exam. And then I will tell you what the exam is like. And you can decide whether you want to invest uh, your $20 and whether my four idea cases are enough to get you through the exam. I think you'll be close. So I will, I will get back to you on that score. But I think uh, for that price, we, we're doing well. I don't even know what costs $20 anymore. Since Sydney, even TGIF, TF, TGI Fridays or Applebee's or something it is more than 20. So that's that. I'm going to go back here. There we go. Test 5A and 5B. You've done the tests. You do well there. Case number five. So this is Harriet Walters. Uh, we have all those fraud numbers. You remember I went through the fraud numbers, started at 4,000 and ended up near the 410,000. And we're going to do certain tests here on Harriet's numbers using Excel. You also have a reading to do, Journal of Accountancy, round numbers. That's my article. If I must say so myself, I think it was a pretty good article. Um, has anybody looked at this? Any any questions or see the you, you know generally what happens is if you look at the guidance video, if you do the case, you should get a grade that's uh, ninety something. Uh, Just a caution to people: they're hard to print. I printed them out, and they're hard to print out both articles because there's a lot of color and the grayness. Yes. Um, however, th th those PDFs are, are good quality PDFs. Uh, it's the printer that's giving you a problem. I have a question about case four, because I was struggling with that for number two. Um, okay. We're gonna go back now to, to case four? Yeah, I just wanted to get clarification. Um, I can just ask specifically, because I, I feel like a bunch of people probably struggle with this. I couldn't identify which because I went through like all like every almost every single one that was listed in those top numbers for yes. the decimal point. Yes, there it is. Okay, and I know what you mean. Uh, the the decimal point error. Let me just pull up the solution here. I have a, a case for solution. I'll take uh, Suarez. There we go. The one nearest the top that was the decimal point error. I'm, I'm fine with you asking. There's no problem there. And I just lost it, didn't I? Here it is. When, it, when, when they have pennies over there, they cannot be a decimal point error. So we're cruising down to look at the first number that could have been keyed in without the decimal point. And so it is possible that this one here was $475, 475 .00, and the next one was 185. This is the one closest to the top that could have been a decimal point error. However, I also took this one as a possible answer, New Horizons Boston. I was gonna put that one, I decided not to. It was between that one and there was another one because I saw a lot of the bills for the police officers for like yeah. different things and they ranged like a lot. So, ugh, shooting. Oh, well. Yeah. And I'm sorry to do it. You know, sometimes things just have to count 10 points or five points when we only have um, six questions. The, uh, yeah, then they have to count a lot of points. Sorry about that. 
<laughs> um, fair. So this was Harriet Walters case five there. Idea three is here. And idea three should work very well. They got the guidance video keeps you keeps you going. This one here is specifically for accounting 584 because you're going to be asked exactly to do what was sent but not received. And so what we can do is you can just do this as your case. You can watch the guidance video. And when we get talk to each other next week, I, I will show you a little bit more about uh, your your case for accounting 584. I'll just bring it See if I can pull it across. So this is accounting 584. This is 584 information. I have some files here and you can see that we have a, a sent and we have a received and Professor Riley is going to want you to answer what was sent but not received. And to clarify again, this is our practice and we'll come back to it before the end of the class. So we're, we're already practicing here. This idea case should be fine. You should, you should be good to go. Can you confirm for number one, because I'm a little, I started this. Yes. You just want the states, you don't want a screenshot? No, I will show you the answer if you... Because I have the answer, but there, yes. you don't want to, yeah, I want to see if you want a screenshot or just the answer. I'll be fine. I'll, I'll show you. I'm. There we go. Idea three. There we go. So See what's screenshot? Yeah, it used to be a quiz years ago. Don't worry about that. But it'll be a screenshot, and it will look like this. Okay. Yep. And what you will see is when you get a duplicate in idea, it will list it on two lines or three lines if there are uh, if there's a triplicate. And so there are seven duplicates. You can see the same state, mm -hmm. same population, different counties, same state, same population number, different counties. So this will be our answer for one. A, a screenshot that looks like that will make me happier than uh, I could possibly be. And then this one is just formatting it a little neater and put getting that uh, comma separated in. Sign off and stop recording.